This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. How much do billionaires really pay in taxes? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my co-host, Liz Wolf, Reason associate editor and author of the Daily Reason Roundup newsletter. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Today, the super rich control a greater share of America's wealth than during the Gilded Age of the Carnegies and Rockefellers. Those are the words of Gabriel Zuckman in a recent New York Times opinion piece entitled, it's time to tax the billionaires. Zuckman is an economist at the Paris School of Economics and UC Berkeley and a frequent collaborator with superstar economist Thomas Piketty, author of the extremely influential book on wealth inequality capital in the 21st century. But hold on a second. Today's guest, Phil Magnus, says the work of Piketty and his circle of inequality-obsessed colleagues is deeply flawed and sometimes outright deceptive. He points out that billionaires do pay taxes, a lot of taxes, and that the inequality literature, he says, is riddled with errors and bad stats. Magnus is an economic historian, author, and the David J. Thoreau Chair in Political Economy at the Independent Institute. Phil, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let us start by looking at this first claim made by Zuckman in the New York Times. Let me bring that back up here. Uh, there we go. So um, this graph purports to show the effective tax rate for the 400 richest Americans plummeting from 56% in 1960 to 23% in 2018, which incredibly appears lower than the 24% effective tax rate on the bottom half of income earners. So in other words, the poorest Americans are paying more of their, in, uh, a larger share of their income in taxes than are the richest. And you say this is misleading. Why? Absolutely. Well, uh, this chart, which was tweeted all over the world and uh, celebrated by Elizabeth Warren, pushed out by Gabriel Zuckman, basically manipulates the numbers to get the results that he wanted. And they do this right. through two ways. Uh, that top line that you see there that purports to be the rate that the, the wealthiest earners are taxed at, the billionaires, uh, 400 mm -hmm. richest Americans, uh, they actually suppress that rate by reallocating the share of corporate taxation uh, to the wealthiest shareholders, which is a very unconventional way of, uh, of handling corporate tax incidents. What that does is it suppresses the rate that they actually pay, at least in appearance, over time. And in the meantime, for the bottom half, the uh, lower income earners, they actually exclude intentional tax credits, like the earned income tax credit and child tax credit that benefit uh, poor people by basically giving them a tax break. And it turns out if you yeah. take out the tax breaks that they have, well, shocker, the rate goes up. <laughs> so uh, basically, these two statistics are inaccurate, unrepresentative of reality, and yet they're being touted as a basis for tax sure. policy. All right. Let me talk about that first line on the top first uh, with where you say that basically they played some games with the way that corporate taxes are calculated. Could you just explain that a little bit more? Um, what did they do and why is that wrong and misleading in yeah. your mind? Well, if, if you look at corporate tax rates over time, they've generally gone in a downward trend. Uh, you go back to the mid-century, 1950s and 1960s, uh, corporations are taxed at a higher rate, as are personal incomes. But that downward trend, you see uh, an succession of tax cuts that occurred, mainly starting in about the 1980s and continuing to uh, the present day. And what it's done is it's reduced the rate on, um, on taxes that corporations pay. Now, how do you allocate the burden of corporate taxation to people? This is a, a tricky and very complex theory of economics called tax incidence economics. And we have a, a robust literature going back to the 1960s that say uh, the people that actually end up paying or shouldering the burden of corporate taxation are not necessarily the direct shareholders themselves. Shareholders do pay, uh, pay some of, uh, of the burden of it, but it also allocates onto other sectors of the economy through the distortive effects of of taxation. Uh, so uh, there are several studies that have shown, for example, that workers, laborers, uh, incur some of the incidents of corporate taxation, whether they own the shares 
of the company or not. Uh, some of it right. also spills over in uh, very complex ways onto competitors. And when you do these adjustments, you do uh, uh, tax incidents calculations for corporate taxation, you have to impose a set of assumptions upon how you want to allocate those numbers. Well, uh, Zuckman and his colleague, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Sayers, used to follow the economic literature pretty strictly on this, uh, very conventional literature where they'd, uh, they'd allocate a share to corporate tax, uh, to uh, corporate shareholders, but they'd also allocate portions of it to some of these other people that incur incidents. And you get a really uh, uh, even distribution of the way that uh, corporate tax incidents is incurred, uh, basically spread across different sectors of the economy that economists have theorized. Well, what they did when they uh, produced this new chart is they engaged in what I would call outright statistical trickery. Uh, they only assigned corporate tax incidents to the physical shareholders, which happened to be the rich, happened to be the wealthy. Uh, wealthy Americans owned a larger share of, uh, of, of corporate uh, shares, basically, than any other American. Uh, and as a result of that, it tilts the entire trajectory of this upper line. Uh, so basically now it follows the succession of corporate tax rate cuts, uh, whereas previously, if you actually distributed the incidents in a uh, realistic way, uh, it would be much more flat, much more level. Why didn't they use the same methods that would be in keeping with the methods they used to use 10, 20 years ago? Well, that's the trick. I, I argue that Zuckman tried to pull an academic sleight of hand. Uh, that's he, a really big accusation. It, it is. And I, I think the evidence is there for it. So <laughs> if we go back to 2018, Zuckman and his colleagues uh, published an article in the, in the uh, Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is a really... A uh, well-regarded, high-end uh, academic venue, and this article used conventional allocations of uh, corporate tax incidents. They followed Arnold Harberger's uh, approach that goes all the way back to the 1960s and has been updated by some subsequent literature. But it was a very standard way, and they state this outright in the article that we are following the conventions of the field in the way we allocate corporate tax incidents. Well, this gave them a result that was at odds with their political story. Because remember, they, they're, they're claiming that tax cuts in the 1980s to the present have caused inequality to soar. But when you looked at the results, and you can see the chart there, I pulled this directly out of their data set. Uh, the incidence of taxation, the effective tax rate on the rich, so this is corporate taxes, this is income taxes, this is everything that they could measure uh, between 1962 and roughly today, so they, they took this all the way up to the mid 2010s, which is the data they had at the time. Now, this is yeah, the top 2014. Yeah, top 0.001% of earners. Uh, this is roughly 1,200 to 1,400 tax filers, so the billionaires. It's the elite of the elite. And you can see the tax rate over time. In 1962, the effective tax rate on uh, the ultra wealthy was about 44%. We'll go all the way forward to 2014. Where is it? It's just over 40%. So mm. it had gone down, and of course, there's some fluctuations over time that uh, have to do with business cycles and some other events, but it had gone down by basically about four percentage points uh, since the 1960s. That story right. does not fit their narrative about inequality. About so their narrative, you know, in short, is inequality has, you know, massively increased over the decades that we were just reviewing. Um, and in part, that's due to the slashing of taxes on the rich. And you're saying, wait a second, no, using the, their own methods that they used to use to calculate this, you know, we're seeing a very, very similar, very consistent tax burden from the 60s exactly. until basically today. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's very slightly gone down. And this comes from streamlining the tax code. But uh, the wealthy are still shouldering far and away the largest share of the tax burden. But that and doesn't... Let yeah. Well, there, I want to I want to com let's compare it to the 2019 data, the the adjustment that you say happened. I just want to put these side by side and you explain to me why these look different. So here's 2018, which we were just explaining. It looks like, you, you know, you kind of end up in the same place you started a, a very slightly lower. And then here it is compared oh to the readjustment. Right. The orange That's line crazy. is going, you know, starting in the upper left corner, goes down below 
uh, 30%, you know, between 20 and 30%. So what happened here? How did they massage the data to get this result? So almost all of the change here comes from altering the way they assign corporate tax incidents. Uh, they okay. just altered their assumptions. It's the same data input, but by changing that one little assumption and reallocating it entirely to shareholders, they took what was basically a flat line and made it a downward angled line that now fits this claim they're touting in the New York Times where uh, you, you see the uh, the tax rate in the uh, 1960s, it jumped from about 44% to uh, it's near 55%, which was the claim that he made in the New York Times. And then he'd go all the way forward to uh, the mid 2010s and it's no longer 40% that the rich are paying. They're now down to 22, 23%, which they claim is a lower rate than uh, lower income Americans are paying. So it's all because so of changing assumptions. Yeah. So would, I mean, is there a possible defense of changing that uh, way of calculating? Yeah. Was that there any it, explanation it, right, for why it, they That it actually is, um, you know, the fact that wealthier people own more stock, that is a, that, that, that is a better way to calculate where okay. the taxes are falling. Because let me pull up like one slide in there that they might make in their defense. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is also from the New York Times article that says taxes on wages has increased as corporate taxes have decreased. So right, the green right. line, you can see the payroll tax going up, the corporate in tax going down, and they would just argue, we need to capture the fact that this means the tax burden is shifting between you know uh, different levels of earning potential. Right, right. So Zuckman himself, offers a defense of doing this, but he doesn't do so until after he's caught, which is the really mm. interesting giveaway. Uh, the, uh, another way to think of this, they published in a top economics uh, venue, the Quarterly Journal of Economics. This means that you have to make airtight arguments that go through rigorous peer review, often multiple rounds before uh, top experts in the field of economics. And in doing so, when they adopted the conventional way of assigning corporate tax incidents, they met 60 plus years of academic literature that they had to go through uh, basically a screening on to show that they were doing the methods consistent and the right way with that literature. Uh, so that's how they got it published. But then Zuckman does something really interesting when he realizes he has this problem. And this is around 2019. Uh, randomly one day, he removed his data replication file from his personal website for this already published article. And come out well. So that's the smoking gun. That's right? the smoking gun. It just disappears, and uh, you know, several people notice this. Does he in, know about the Internet Archive or like the Wayback Machine? Well, well that, that's that's what caught him because yeah, he well, put, Phil he does it, not that unfortunately the, for exactly. him. <laughs> he, he puts this new file up, and the old one disappears. And uh, you know, I, I was involved in, in when this originally broke, but it was a couple of other economists. I think Jeremy Warpedal. Uh, who's colleague? He's wonderful. Yeah, sometimes co-author with him. Uh, he also noticed it about the same time, and posts on Twitter. Um, Wait a minute, there's here's a side by side of the before and after of your website. Where did your data file go? Uh, and he, he really doesn't have any answer. And then Zuckman sees all of this and kind of panics. And this is after I've called them out. I pointed out that the two charts no longer align. Uh, Jeremy yeah. and a few other economists had pointed out that uh, his website had changed and he panics and suddenly he reposts the old file. He puts it back up and then uh, a couple months go by and he releases a new, like a white paper, a working paper that tries to retroactively justify all these decisions. And what he comes up with is, is this extremely heterodox viewpoint that says we need to discard the last 60 years of corporate tax incidents literature and adopt this new way that I'm proposing, which assigns the entirety of the burden directly onto uh, shareholders. Uh, this would be a more compelling argument, I would imagine, if that is the work that he had been doing prior to releasing this. But now it looks exactly. a little bit like he's attempting to salvage his own reputation and like he was caught doing something uh, pretty deceptive. Um, you know, he was caught in this, you know, web of deceit. And now he's trying to figure out a way to retrofit the data onto a new narrative. But it's like, well, wait a second. You know, if you actually believed that to the extent that you claim you do, why didn't you make that case a few years ago prior to the publication of this and prior to being caught? Well, that's exactly it. And I think the obvious answer here is 
had he submitted this new heterodox way of, uh, of calculating corporate tax incidents, he never right. would have made it through peer review of a top economics journal. Uh, they would right. have asked him, why aren't you citing Harburger 1962 in 60 plus years of, of literature ever since then? Uh, you can't just introduce this new approach that completely inverts everything we know about corporate tax incidents so, and kind of wave your hands and make assert that this is the new way to do it. But instead of going through peer review, he made this under the radar adjustment and then went right to the popular media. Exactly. Post, exactly. New York Times, like, Elizabeth Warren's office. Peer review by the New but, York Times, peer review by sympathetic journalists who presented yeah. as fact, even though this was a, a major significant change to a previously published article. Let's look at the other aspect of that you have a problem with in a little more detail, uh, which is this bottom line, the bottom half of income earners um, paying more, having a larger share of the tax it, burden. Uh, and you mentioned that this what a lot of this can be explained by the exclusion of the earned income tax credit. Uh, and here's uh, just a this is a graph from the CBO um, showing uh, the average refundable tax credit rates among different income groups. The lowest quintile, unsurprisingly, is the largest beneficiary of the earned income tax credit. And um, then the second and middle quintile are uh, further down there. Um, his explanation, I'll just put it up here right away, is that uh, the reason they did that is that um, he says, our analysis treats refundable tax credits as government transfers instead of as negative taxes and that the earned income tax credit payments are ad that just because the earned income tax credits are administered by the IRS, and a large portion of the public has become used to thinking about them as a negative tax. Um, what might be good politics doesn't necessarily correspond to what is conceptually consistent. Economically, the earned income tax credit is no different from other cash transfers to low income families. What do you make of that defense of his method methodological change. It's an extremely tendentiously argued hand-waving exercise. I mean, if our objective here is to actually measure the tax rates that poor people pay, that lower income Americans pay, you have to include the credits. And that, that I mean, that's how these programs were designed. The EITC is introduced in the mid-1970s as an intentional way to offset the burden of the federal income tax on the poor, and in doing so, also offset the total tax burden on the poor. Uh, it's implemented through successive legislative measures that are wrapped into the tax code. It's administered at the tax code. Zuckman's trying to make this almost contrived argument that basically says, uh, you know, we should treat the yard income tax credit like a social security check, which is a, it's an old age pension, it's a government old age pension that is collected at one point in life, and it is a transfer in the sense that we don't uh, uh, actually get our own input back. It's other people that are paying for it, but we right. uh, we receive Social Security payments after retirement in a very different way. The EITC is integrated fully into the tax code, and even more than that, and they, uh, Zuckman actually acknowledges this and then just pushes it away, dismisses it. Uh, the way that the Congressional Budget Office and the IRS and federal agencies have always handled the yard income tax credit is to integrate it into tax incidents, integrated into the tax code. The CBO has been doing this since the late 1970s. They they calculate, uh, as you saw on that chart, the distribution uh -huh. of the earned income tax credit across income quintiles, and they also calculate tax burdens. They integrate them in together, and what it turns out is uh, instead of like 22, 23% that Zuckman's showing, uh, the tax burden on lower income earners is more in the neighborhood of 11 or 12 percent. So it's uh, it's uh, almost half of, uh, I mean, of the actual uh, number is, is almost half of what uh, Zuckman is saying. Uh, and it's all just by this accounting trick that he's doing because he wants to tell a political story that make uh, makes it look like the poor are paying a much higher rate than they actually are. To me, this is so highly offensive because at least my form of libertarianism, you know, as the, the thing that I come back to is obviously wanting a lower tax burden on all people and obviously Absolutely. wanting smaller government. But the plight of the poor in the United States is not 
um, you know, this this thing that I sort of hand wave or dismiss away. Um, making sure that poor people have a good standard of living is very important to me. Absolutely. And in fact, that's why I'm a capitalist, because I, I very much believe in the power of markets uh, to deliver abundance and higher standards of living over time. And I see that benefiting the rich and the poor. Um, and to, like that's why I'm a libertarian. That's why, you know, oppose government redistribution. I think that capitalism is the best means to doing all of this. So therefore, it is especially important to me to have an accurate sense of what life as a poor person in the United States is actually like, what the tax burden looks like, um, in which ways the government uh, makes your life harder or easier. And so I'm not totally sure. I mean, I guess I guess it's it's just classic good old fashioned politics. It's politics as a team sport that's leading to this distortion here. But I mean, really, why is he interested in misleading people as to what the plight of the poor in the United States actually is? Well, the end game for him is making the case for a national wealth tax. It's making the case for higher income taxes. And if the if the tax system that we already have is, in fact, using things like the EITC to reduce the burden on the poor, his entire argument for the policy he wants goes away. Hmm. And, and notice if you read the New York Times article, he does not disclose that he's doing either of these statistical tricks. He doesn't say, I'm using an unconventional uh, corporate tax incidents accounting for the top. He doesn't say that he's excluding the EITC and other tax credits for the bottom. Uh, he just presents it as is, as if this is the uh, the actual tax rate that rich people and poor people experience and pay in their real lives. And it turns out we have policies that um, are, are actually offsetting the tax burden on the poor in very, very substantial and intentional ways. So by leaving that out, he's, he's almost like fomenting a case uh, to try to get uh, lower income people to agitate for higher taxes on the wealthy uh, to, to to argue for redistribution. Uh, and this yet feels it's like this feels like um, basically like rage bait dressed up in you know intellectual clothes. Like it feels like it's pandering to the um, New York Times Elizabeth Warren voting class who is most likely to be in favor of this type of thing. Um, but it's very much designed yeah. to get people angry about the state of you know, wealth in the United States without necessarily um, having that reflect reality. Yeah. yeah, he's claiming that our tax system is unfair, but uh, any other objective statistical analysis says we have a tax system that is extremely progressive and has been basically since its inception. There's this, I pulled this from the Tax Foundation to try to attempt to discover, well, how much do the wealthy pay in taxes, actually? And um, I'm curious if you think this is a more accurate picture or not. Um, they say that half of taxpayers paid 97.7% of federal income tax. And then when you break it down here, you can see that dark uh, gold there, 45% uh, um was paid by the top 1%, and then you can add in another 20%, so we're getting up to uh, you know, uh, uh, 65% paid by the top 5%. Um, is this a more <laughs> accurate picture than what uh, Zuckman is presenting, um, or do you have qualms with, with this data? Well, this is the revenue side, and basically what it's showing is the tax system that we have draws disproportionately, overwhelmingly, from the highest income earners. So uh, that's clear no. as day, and it's been that way for a long, long time in the data that, um, uh, you know, the wealthiest are shouldering the uh, uh, the greatest share of the federal government's revenue burden. Yes, 65% of our government revenue, like of what's filling the government coffers comes from, I mean, what rough income level is the top 5%? Yeah, you're, you're getting into the several hundred thousand dollar range. I mean, these are comfortably in the six figures as you get uh, above the 1%. I don't know the exact cutoff this year, but you start talking about million dollar incomes uh, pretty quickly. And then when you get to that really top slice, that 0.001%, uh, these are high multi-million dollar uh, incomes that are coming in. It's, it's really uh, heavily tilted toward the top. But I, I'd say anyone in, those, in the gold and even the yellow categories uh, there on that chart is comfortably upper middle class and higher. So like the working rich is how it's sometimes referred to. Absolutely. In this letter, right. So working rich, I've written about this a little bit in the context of Elizabeth Warren's um, 
absolutely batty tax proposals. But working rich essentially, you know, frequently refers to people who aren't necessarily in that one percent, but are more in that top five percent. You know, the coastal city um, doctors and lawyers, sometimes dual income households, maybe people who will at some point receive inheritances or who came from wealthy families, but aren't necessarily um, set up for life the way that somebody in the one percent might be. Working rich people who generally, you know, go out to high end restaurants. but definitely still have to um, earn money to pay for their rent or to pay for their mortgage. Uh, think about the stereotypical like lawyer in Los Angeles or New York as an example of the working rich. Those exactly. are the people who are paying for, who are generating the taxes um, that fill up roughly 65% of our nation's total coffers. That's, that's yeah. entirely but, the case. Yeah. And then, um, you know, so much of the focus now is on billionaires. I mean, this was the headline of the New York Times article. It's time to tax billionaires as if um, they aren't paying any taxes. Um, and and by the way, I mean, you're presenting some really uh, damning data to counter this. And um, it's very troubling. And I am just going to openly offer if Zuckman or anyone else wants to come on this show to uh, defend this methodology, you have an open invitation because I, I definitely have some questions uh, based on what Phil's presented here and what I'm about to show also, which is your correction of their long-term projection of uh, what the top point like zero 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 one percent is the the billionaire class. Right. Um, this is basically combining. Uh, a study that you did and a study that um, uh, Auten and Splinter, who are you know <laughs> not like, l- yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think it's a different chart, but because uh, that's still Zuckman. Oh, sorry. Right? Yes, yes, this yes, is the right? wrong uh, chart. Yeah, I think it's this one here. Uh, uh, no, that's not it. Uh, uh, one second. I don't know who's worse, Zuckman or Zach, <laughs> lying about the facts <laughs> that over here. Oh, here. I think it's 12. Yeah, here. One second. Hold. Bear with me. So let us data here. Oh, uh, there so, we are. Okay, there we is, are. Yeah. Yep. Th- this is yeah. This so this is from a study by um, Auten and uh, Splinter. Maybe you, you could first just explain who they are because this yep. was a major counter to have the the inequality data that had been coming out um, from Piketty and Zuckman and and this crew. Yeah. So uh, Gerald Otten and David Splinter, they're two economists that work in the U.S. Treasury Department and at the Joint Tax Commission, so they're they're tax statisticians. And earlier this year, they published an article in the Journal of Political Economy that had been in the works for many years, revisiting the income distribution claims of Thomas Piketty. And you can see that on the chart there. They put their study side by side with Thomas Piketty. So uh, Piketty is, um, uh, you, you see... Actually, that, there should be another chart there that has his numbers on there. Uh, that's the one. There we are. So Piketty, you see, is the blue line. And that yeah. uh, represents the top 10% income share over the century. You can do the top 1%, top uh, 0.5%, whatever segment that you wanted to break it down into. But you see it makes this U-shaped pattern across the century where it's very, very high, then it drops uh-huh. down at the mid-century, and then it rebounds in the 1980s. And what's going on there? is uh, they're, they're trying to claim that the tax rates uh, over the century have caused inequality to go down and then go up. So high taxes supposedly cause low inequality, low taxes cause inequality to rebound. But what happens in Auten and Splinter's work, and you can see their main figure is in that, uh, that dotted orange line uh, yeah. that represents the second half of the chart. So they calculated from about the 1960s to the present, uh, they went through and they corrected some accounting errors in Piketty and say is his work. And they did some further steps. Uh, they found that if you actually include post-tax and post-transfer income, so you bring in all the welfare benefits, you bring in uh, the existing progressivity, the line flattens out even further. So that was that previous chart that you had. Um, if you go back to it, so if you see the red line down at the bottom after tax income, this is including all the taxes and transfers that we have. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically what they're saying is the welfare state and tax system that we have already flattened out inequality from the 1960s to the present. This claim right. rebound uh, is just an illusion uh, that only comes from bad accounting, bad data, 
and uh, pre-tax, pre-transfer yes. income that's not yeah. realistic. Let me, let me pull up. This is the uh, kind of the original U graph that came out mm. in Eddie's book. Um, so it's a very dramatic U. You know, it's saying back in the Gilded Age here in the 20s and 30s, uh, this is the amount of income that was held by the top 1%. Um, and then we kind of had a flat, you know, we went down in the 50s and 60s, and then we're back to the bad old days of like the, the barons of old. And this then complicates the picture because you are saying that this is the prop, this is a sounder methodology to do it because it gets at what we're interested in, which is like, how much money do people have at the end of the day instead of kind of an abstract debate about taxes? Yeah, and that's exactly it. There's a disconnect in Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman's argument because they're taking pre-tax, pre-transfer data and say, well, this is why we need to raise taxes, make them more progressive. This is why we need to redistribute income. But then if you look at the redistribution we already have, you look at the tax system we already have, it's already accomplished what they claim that they're going after. So it's like a before and after pic, uh, picture. They're using apples to oranges. Uh, they're apples being this pre-tax, pre-transfer version of the income distribution that also has other accounting problems in it. And they're saying, uh, this is why we need to adopt all of these policies. But it turns out if you switch to the oranges, the post-tax, post-transfer system we already have, uh, the claimed problem goes away. There's, um, you know... There's long been an argument that people within the Austrian school of economics have made that there is a tendency not only to lie with statistics, but for the economists who are most skilled at that to tell a certain story that flatters power um, are the ones who advance in the field. Um, is that um, too cynical a story here, or like, do you more or less buy that analysis of, of what's going on? Well, if you look on Gabriel Zuckman's website, he proudly touts a letter of exchange between him and Elizabeth Warren, where he is advising her on how to design a wealth tax. So hey. I think he, he is absolutely seeking influence in the halls of power. Uh, even more recently, and this is what precipitated the new New York Times article, he went through to the G20 uh, summit meeting that was just held a couple weeks ago uh, at the invitation of the Brazilian government. They were the chairs this year, and we know Brazil has basically a socialistic regime in place, and they put him up on the stage to make the case for a global wealth tax. So it, it's quite clear that he is not just doing academic analysis, not just doing objective uh, statistical uh, work on, on inequality. He is trying to uh, give politicians tools and arguments to make the case for higher taxation, and he'll openly state that. So, uh, so yes, you see the motive at play here. Uh, whereas I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical of taxes. My normative preferences are are like both of y'all's. Uh, taxes are probably too high, and if you want to maximize freedom, you want to maximize uh, economic opportunity. Yes, uh, we have a normative preference for lower taxes. But I also want to get the statistics right. I also want to ensure that we're measuring the tax regime that we currently have in its full effectiveness. And when you do that that way, uh, you get a very different picture than this politicized version that Zuckman and Piketty and their colleagues are pushing to the New York Times. Right. You mentioned the uh, the correspondence with Elizabeth Warren, um, and she's been one of the most outspoken proponents of this idea of a wealth tax. Uh, she pushed it very hard in her 2020 campaign for presidency. I've pulled a clip from the debate, uh, the Democratic primary debate, where she makes the case for it. I want to play that and then reflect on what a wealth tax would mean for America. <clears throat> I have proposed a two cent wealth tax. That is a tax for everybody who has more than $50 billion in assets. Your first 50 billion is free and clear. But your 50 billionth and first dollar, you gotta pitch in two cents. And when you hit a billion dollars, you gotta pitch in a few pennies more. Here's the thing. 
doing a wealth tax is not about punishing anyone. It's about saying you built something great in this country, good for you. But you did it using workers. All of us help pay to educate. You did it using your getting your goods to roll on roads and bridges. All of us help pay for it. You did it protected by police and firefighters. All of us help pay the salaries for it. So when you make it big, when you make it really big, when you make a top one tenth of one percent big, pitch in two cents. What do you think about that, Phil? It sounds reasonable on its face. You, you're a billionaire. You use the roads and the fire departments and so forth. So pitch in a couple pennies. Well, Elizabeth Warren is playing fast and loose with words and definitions when she does this. You know, our income tax system taxes income. That's the only thing that's constitutionally permitted to tax. What is your income? That's how much you earn over the course of the year. What Elizabeth Warren is doing here, she's playing a sleight of hand. She's actually saying we should tax the net worth, the full value of the billionaire's estate, which is a very which how different would you thing. even do that? I mean, exactly. how do you even go about to get it? Like, that's the part that always really, really bothers me. It always strikes me as Elizabeth Warren and many of the people who boost her talking points are totally disconnected from any understanding of how like wealth management for the ultra rich actually works because i don't even know how you would begin to go about attempting to assess taxes on the entirety of their holdings it, it turns out it's nearly impossible several european countries have tried this before and they immediately encountered all sorts of problems first it's it's extremely difficult to value an estate uh to value someone's net worth and the second effect is it just causes the rich people to move to other countries uh, they leave with their assets. Scandinavia has had this problem, and I covered this a little bit uh, maybe a year or two ago. This is a huge problem in Norway, especially because a ton of Scandinavia's ultra-rich people just flee to Switzerland. Um, and then you essentially have these little expat enclaves of people who are t entirely in their same milieu, who in many cases they already know. So you essentially have these cute little subculture like clusters forming. Um, but I think so frequently the government said, impose these types of schemes don't really understand that like why on earth would anybody stay if they're going to be treated like cash cows cash cows and taken for granted to this degree sure. um also the irs by the way as is currently conducts a whole bunch of correspondence audits so they hit those people who right. are recipients of the earned income tax credit they go after the lowest hanging fruit because that is the cheapest type of audit to conduct you know it's actually very very difficult and requires an awful lot of manpower from the irs auditing rich people. You know what the IRS is currently struggling to do, even though they got that massive cash infusion two years back? They're struggling to hire new agents. The IRS <laughs> simply does not have the resources available to be able to competently do this. So even if Elizabeth Warren got her way tax policy wise, there's an astonishing naivete about how to actually do this in a way that gets you the amount of money from these people that you are looking to get. Yeah, well, It's consistent with her goal. She wants to bureaucratize the entire financial sector. And just to give you perspective, you know, you're, you're talking about audits on income of rich people, just earned income over the course of the year. We're talking about unrealized capital gains, unrealized income. So you'd have to add on top of your earnings someone to value the entirety of your property, your stock, your houses, your real estate, uh, uh, almost anything and everything under the sun. And it turns out this is really difficult. So Zuckman likes to point to things like the Forbes 400 list, which is kind of like this vanity uh, pop media assessment of the richest people in the world. And you have Zuckerberg That's not and Bill real, Gates. Right? It's yeah. not real. Uh, so the, the problem is the IRS has actually studied this issue in the past. About a decade ago, uh, a group of IRS economists took the old Forbes 400 list and they compared people that were previously on it that had died in like the last 30 years. And they looked at their stated published version of their net worth in the Forbes 400 list, and they compared that to the probate records when the uh, when they passed away, how their estate was actually valued. And it turns out they found a, a consistent theme. The Forbes 400 list all, almost always overvalued the actual amount of assets that they had when they died. Uh, and sometimes it was, it was astonishing amounts, like 30, 40, or 50% overvaluation on the Forbes 400 list. So uh, the, the, these year-to-year -year measures, they aren't even accurate uh, versus what you get when you do a, an official probate of, of these estates. And they, so, so they, they dig into it even further, and it turns out there's a reason for this. And so the all of this is... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no I'm here. Well, the, reason, yeah. the, the reason is something that we refer to, and this predates his presidency, as the Donald Trump problem. Huh. The Donald Trump problem yeah. is 
Rich people on the Forbes 400 list view it as a status symbol. So what do they do? When the reporter calls and says, uh, how much is your uh, real estate holding in downtown New York City worth? Uh, Donald What's Trump has a tendency to say uh, a much higher price than it actually would sell for. And he's gotten into some trouble with that. Uh, but he became so notorious for doing this in the 1990s, like Forbes even had internal reporters. They, they, they would tell each other, be real careful when you're measuring Donald Trump's uh, net worth because he has a tendency to lie and overvalue it because he wanted the status of it. So all of this, all of these status games and calls for taxation and the naivete as to how to actually collect revenue on these people, all of this aside, why is it that there's this entire class of economists and politicians who are so concerned, not with, you know, quality, like standard of living, but with the inequality? They're concerned with the spread between yeah. the Donald Trump types and the Liz Wolf types or, or somebody even poor than me. Like, why is it that inequality is the thing that really bothers them? Well, I think they've realized that they've lost on the conventional fiscal argument uh, basis uh, the case to make tax rates go up. You know, the the, uh, the political left has been arguing since the 1980s to the present that we need to tax the rich more, uh, that we need to raise uh, overall income tax rates. And it turns out it's, it's politically unpopular uh, it's also economically damaging. It's not uh, not the best uh, fiscal policy to pursue if you want growth and prosperity. Uh, so they've lost the debate on that margin. Uh, they, they've essentially come uh, re revisited their arguments and uh, rebranded them. Now the purpose of taxation is no longer to uh, raise more money for the government for uh, redistribution, even though that's what they really want. Now they're saying it's all about fairness and we need to go back to a tax system uh, that uh, more heavily burdens the rich, uh, like it may have in the mid uh, 20th century. Although their stats don't don't really show that or bear it out. So it, so it's all kind of like this rationalization game to get higher tax rates, to get tax increases on a margin that they've failed time and time again for the last 30 years. So I mean, your your work has kind of your work and Ott and Splinter, you've sort of flattened out uh, Piketty's U curve, yeah. uh, U curve a little bit there, um, and said that perhaps the inequality is not as great as Piketty suggests. Um, but I do wonder, like, are you? Is there a point where you would be concerned? Are there legitimate concerns where if it hits a certain level, there's bad economic or cultural or social effects that would concern you? Yeah. So I think the interesting thing of their chart, uh, we have flattened it out. If you do uh, a more robust statistical accounting, inequality does fluctuate and changes over time. We know this. And there you see, uh, so the, the dark red line is my own work with Vincent Geloso. And we, we've yeah. since extended this and we're working on merging the two series. But uh, if you use the dark red line as well as the dotted line from Otten and Splinter, it's a much flatter curve over the course mm -hmm. of the century, but it does change. The question that we need to ask is why does it change? Well, Piketty's narrative is when taxes go up, inequality goes down, or when taxes go yep. down, inequality goes up. And some of the revisions we've done, they've not only flattened the curve, they've broken that claim of causality. It no longer wow. holds. Uh, it turns out inequality goes up and down for a host of other reasons. And the big two, the ones that we know of uh, from uh, time and time again in history, are not good reasons. Uh, they're the Great Depression, so they're a financial collapse. That will flatten out the wealthy because uh, you know they are, they're the ones that lose uh, their shirt in the stock market, uh, as happened in 1929. Yeah. So if you see on that chart, there is a major drop in 1929 as a result of the stock market crash in the Great Depression, and it plays mm -hmm. out over the course of the next decade. Uh, the other reason, wars. And it, so and, just massive, sorry, just, just to underscore that, just massive destruction of wealth. Yeah, wealth massive flat. destruction of wealth. is the point, first point there. By, okay. by an economic uh, disaster. More. Yeah. Uh, and, and the second and then, one. Yeah, explain the war point. Yeah. yeah so, so you see the same chart in Europe. They have a U-shaped pattern. And it turns out uh, the leveling occurs, the drop in the wealth in the top percent, uh, top 1% occurs when the cities of Europe are being bombed into oblivion uh, during World War II. It's the physical destruction of wealth and capital. And that actually does have a leveling effect on European society. So you've got the two things that are actual causes of changes in this uh, 
and, and the curve's trajectory are things that uh, I would not wish upon anyone, and I think no sane person would, and yet that's kind of the implication of, uh, of Piketty's narrative is uh, the only guaranteed way to uh, uh, reduce inequality is to physically destroy well uh, through economic I mean, disaster or war. And, and they're, so they're... how is it that this is able to be branded as like aspirational or like a good thing? Like, is this just some of the fine print that's gotten lost along the way because then Piketty's narrative has been yeah. so successful? Well, he acknowledges it and he kind of hand waves it away and he says, but really the thing that we need to care about, really the mechanism is uh, the tax rate. So uh, he's trying they're... to shift attention away from depression and war and onto this policy lever that he thinks he can control uh, by raising or lowering the tax rate. You can get a... Uh, uh, an inverse relationship in the concentration of income and wealth. There's, I mean, there's. This is one uh, central premise of <laughs> Mc, uh, Piketty's argument. Uh, this is just a slide straight from his TED talk um, that R is greater than G. R being the rate of return on capital uh, tends to exceed the gr the economy's growth rate, and so therefore, the rich are getting. Uh, richer off of these investments, but the economy is growing at a slower rate. And so they are not actual, the implication there is that they are not actually like, that's not proportionally growing the economy right. for right. everybody. How how true uh -huh. is this? How concerned are you about this equation? Yeah, so I, I'm not equation? terribly concerned. I think at one level, it's just kind of an accounting equation and it's value neutral. The way that Piketty uses it, he, he basically argues that wealth is a product of what he calls a rentier society. It's uh, wealthy people inheriting capital, in inheriting assets and passing it on to their children. And all they have to do is sit there on their piles of money like Scrooge McDuck and returns will come in from uh, uh, other uh, segments of the economy. This is everything from people that rent real estate uh uh, that are paying them as, as tenants to their landlords to uh, uh, just returns on investment. Basically, they live the good life and have to do essentially nothing. And Piketty's yeah. argument is that uh, the capital stock operates in such a way that it'll it'll outpace income earnings over time, and that's what he claims gives you inequality. Well, again, if you dig deeper into this, it turns out he's rigging the statistics. He's putting his finger on the scale. And in his book, he has another U-shaped chart where he takes the ratio of uh, the capital stock, the private capital stock, uh, to, to output or, or national income. And he and he purports to show that over the course of the century, it drops down from the Gilded Age, and then it rebounds again when taxes are cut. Uh, if you dig into the statistics, because uh, this is a, a worldwide global measure, you dig into the statistics, you find out he did another really unconventional trick. When the mid-20th century, you had several countries around the globe, uh, maybe as much of a third of the world's economy, was under communism. It's the Soviet <laughs> Union, it's China, it's uh, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, and in those exact years, from basically the end of World War II to the fall of the Berlin Wall, what does he do? He zeroes out the capital to income ratio in his calculations for the Soviet and other communist countries, because he's accepting as an ideological claim that they have eliminated inequality. Uh, wow. They have uh, made That's all private nice ownership me. public, and uh, the, these these perfectly equal Soviet and Soviet style societies have solved the problem of inequality. Therefore, we can zero out their capital to income ratio. Therefore, uh, we supposedly have proven that R is greater than G in uh, in the mid century time. So. Uh, this is like a recurring pattern for this guy. Uh, whenever he has the opportunity to manipulate the statistics, he puts his finger on the scale in such a way that gives him the result that he wants. And he is now one of the most famous economists in the world. And he, I, um, you know, Liz earlier brought up the idea with the wealth tax that the wealthy can just escape the, they'll just move their capital to escape the wealth tax. Uh, Piketty actually has a solution for that that he offers in his TED Talk that I want to play a clip from for a second and then reflect on as we bring this to a close. What, what could be done? You know, the first thing is that, you know, I think we need more financial transparency. 
you know, we know too little about uh, global uh, wealth dynamics. So we need international transmission of bank information. We need a global registry of financial assets, more coordination on wealth taxation. And, you know, even wealth tax with a small tax rate will be a way to produce information so that then we can adapt our policies, uh, you know, to whatever we observe. And to some extent, you know, the fight against tax havens and automatic transmission of information is pushing us in this direction. Now, there are other ways to redistribute wealth, you know, which uh, uh, it can be tempting to use. You know, inflation, you know, it's much easier to print money than to write a tax code. So, you know, that's very tempting. But sometimes you don't know what you do with the money. This is a problem. Uh, expropriation, you know, is very tempting. You know, just when you feel some people get too wealthy, you just expropriate them. But this is not a very efficient way to organize the regulation of wealth dynamics. So, uh, wars is an even less efficient way. So, I tend to prefer progressive taxation. But, of course, you know, history... History will invent its own pathways and it will probably involve a combination of all of this. Nothing is more scary than having this strange French man telling me that I need to fork over all of my financial information. No, just financial right. transparency, global coordination. Now uh, I believe those, in those one world governance. For like right. total <laughs> global surveillance of every transaction. Yeah, no big that, deal. You know, we'll just print yeah. more money and also total global financial surveillance. What could go yeah. wrong? And he just like kind of hand waves this away as like, yeah, yeah, no, good idea, good idea. Yeah. No, Th this not. is where I like get really concerned because there's this still this looming specter of the CBDCs hanging yes, over yes. our heads. I think that that is uh, their preferred method of achieving this because once it's completely program, once you every cent in your bank account is completely programmable and trackable by the central bank, then yeah, they can have complete financial transparency um, uh, around the world. And I, I think that this is something like libertarians need to be really uh, having our antennas up and um, ready to resist uh, best we can. Well, it's astounding. And note the circularity in his argument. He's basically taking it as an axiom. Inequality is a problem, but we don't know how much of a problem it is because we don't have full regulation of the world economy uh, we don't have right. uh, monitors of the entire banking system. Therefore, we need to enact all of these uh, global governments type, type uh, tracking measures to see every transaction, every exchange that occurs to prove that inequality is a problem. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, where do you start on this? Uh, uh, every solution is just reaffirmation of a premise that he's begun with in the beginning. And what it basically means is the complete abolition of any sense of financial privacy, of, uh, of really any aspect of uh, free and open market exchange, because he wants to subject it all to the hand of regulators. Uh, it's, it's command and control me, economy. To me, this seems strikingly totalitarian. I mean, right? Like, what could possibly be um, more of a pathway to total control over what we do with our money and our time and and than a, trying to institute a system where governments uh, have total control over um, what our wealth looks like and where we can keep Excellent. I mean, to me, this is the entire fundamental uh, selling proposition for Bitcoin. But I mean, what he's saying, it seems so innocuous. And in reality, I think it would be a path to, you know, extraordinary surveillance and ruin. Yeah. And we have to assume that government actors are not going to be these impartial neutral bureaucrats uh that there are bad actors in government and any type of system of the type that he proposes would absolutely be abused would absolutely be used to go after political enemies uh to go after people that uh, are disliked by the current regime and he has no concern for that no care for it yeah. uh, i mean in fact this is a guy that like touted the soviet union as this uh, uh time of higher equality um, it, it's clear that he has a high tolerance for some very uh, awful totalitarian regimes that uh, I think most people would rightly recoil at. There's, um, you know, this tax policy can be hard to get people interested in, or it, it's like it could be mind numbing to the layman. But that you, I think you're right that the progressive left has really captured it by putting it in these moral terms. This is a moral crusade against billionaires and inequality. Therefore, we need to grow the bureaucratic state and um, really track all of your financial transactions. 
Do you think that there is a compelling counter moral case instead of just the economic case of, um, you, you, you know, uh, what effect it's going to have on, um, you know, what percentage of growth of, of the of GDP is going to slow by raising the marginal tax rates? Like, is there a strong moral counter case against continually ratcheting up uh, yeah. taxation, um, especially at, on the higher at the higher levels. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a fundamental justice that uh, you get to keep what you earn, and you know this is the question at the root of taxation. Taxation is essentially an appropriation of something that you earn by another party, uh, by something that acts as the government. And I think we acquiesce, we accept that taxation is a reality of life. But when taxation becomes too onerous when they start taking more than uh, their fair share, that is absolutely a moral case as well as an economic one. And, and I'd point to this, uh, you know, you ask the question, uh, who is a better uh, curator, caretaker of money, of uh, financial resources, the private sector or the government? Uh, what do we know of every yeah. government that's existed in the history of the world? They're wasteful, they're corrupt. They benefit their friends and their cronies. They give favoritist uh, deals to uh, people that are connected to politicians. And above all, they like to use that money on things that are, are actually physically destructive. They like to, to uh, build armies and uh, and bombs and engage in war. Uh, things that are, are, are actually horrific in their uh, in the havoc they wreak on, on people's lives. Uh, so, so, you know, m my question is, would you rather have a giant pile of money situated in the private sector where it's put to productive ends, it creates jobs, it creates new innovation, it creates products that people want to enjoy and consume and buy and make their lives better, or do you give it to the government, which uh, uh, puts it into the warfare welfare state of uh, uh, helping out their friends, uh, helping out uh, make uh, uh, people that are well-connected to politicians rich, and blowing up other countries? Uh, which is the more moral of the two? Uh, almost every time, it's going to be the private sector. Phil, I want to ask you our last question of the show, which we ask all our guests. I didn't prepare you for this, so <laughs> you can take a second to think if if you want. But uh, we want to uh, ask you: Is there a what is a question that you think more people should be asking? <laughs> well, that's a good one. They think on that. Well, I think there's a fundamental question that more people should be asking their governments when they're paying their taxes, what am I getting in return for it? Uh, how yeah. is this benefiting me? How is this benefiting society? There's a there's this like this assumption that if government spends money, it's it's being spent on behalf of uh, noble public minded ends. And I would urge anyone and everyone that's ever cut a check to the IRS or seen uh, part of their paycheck uh, taken out and automatically given over to the tax man uh, to ask the question, you know, where's my marginal tax dollar being spent? Is it doing something that's benefiting our lives? Is it doing something that is uh, helping to improve society? And I think uh, the answer to that question is it's much more ambiguous than the government would like you to think. Phil Magnus, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Welcome to another segment of Just Ask Us Questions. As a reminder, you can feel free to submit your questions that you have for my esteemed co-host, Zach Weissmuller, and I uh, via just asking questions at reason.com, probably, yep. maybe. I don't actually know the email address. Uh, so let's go ahead and see what the listeners have in store for us today. Benjamin, Benjamin, if that even is his real name, says, howdy. Obviously appropriate howdy. for Texan culture. So I'm quite curious as to why you picked the show name. I've heard bits about the decision littered throughout some of the episodes, but I can't help but wonder if this is a phrase that should die. On the one hand, attorneys doing cross-examinations just ask questions, but no one would confuse them for someone trying to conduct a bias-free inquiry. Worse, this technique is often used by bad faith interlocutor inter <laughs> interlocutor who will, instead of defending their own contentious position, simply attack their opponents with hard questions. Yes, guilt by association is stupid, but don't we have stupid instincts sometimes? Why bother trying to rehabilitate this phrase? On the other hand, I actually think the title minimizes the power questions asked in either good or bad faith. Yeah. 
At best, this name underestimates the power of skepticism, doubt, and rhetoric. While these tools can be used for good, as with guns, it's silly to pretend it isn't dangerous, even if we libertarians prefer this set of risks. Okay, Benjamin, you have to simplify everything. I think you're also overthinking things, might I add. I think Benjamin has thought about this name like 10 times more than I have. <laughs> what do you say? You know, we, well, we came up with the name, uh, you know, we kicked out around a lot of names. Uh, and I liked this one because, first of all, uh, I just love a good question. Uh, maybe that, maybe what pa Benjamin calls a power question. Or was it power of questions? Well, I don't know. But saying there, power yeah. question, he should have offset it somehow with like, I don't know, sure. power questions. Fair enough. Oh. But, you know, there's there's this great book out right now called Super Communicators. It talks a lot about the power of a good question and um, genuine curiosity to create connection and reveal meaning. I ask my kids a question every night and ask them to ask me a question. So I love that. But, what did they ask you? Uh, the last question that I asked them was like, what is the most, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? Um, so uh, it's, 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 good, it's a good routine. But You get the, answers that end up revealing uh, things they've done secretly that you don't know about? Yeah, there's not too many of those yet, but I'm hoping we'll like work our way up to there so we can, we can keep doing this in the teen years. Weissmuller but, friendly entrapment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, but, you know, that, <clears throat> aside from that, you you know, obviously there is a certain fun irony to the Just Asking Questions title, because what we try to do on the show is in a lot of ways the opposite of what the phrase has come to mean. Like to me, Just Asking Questions means raising a bunch of doubts about a mainstream narrative without offering any evidence of a plausible alternative. So instead, you just like float out vague conspiracies, but never really commit to making the case for any of them. Here, I think what we do is we pose a question that challenges the received wisdom, but we try to keep the conversation grounded in data and empirical reality and then asks our guests to help us probe and stress test it uh, using you know those tools instead of just wild speculation. Um, but then, so there's a little like playfulness to the title. It, in it's that a little tongue in cheek, right? Like the entire point is to riff on the fact that people will frequently, like just asking questions carries this connotation of it typically accompanies either conspiratorial thinking or um, very much questioning the mainstream rhetoric. And on one hand, like, yeah, that is sort of what we do. I like to think that yeah. it's not really the conspiratorial version, but I mean, we're skeptics of state power. We're skeptics of a lot of parts of the media so especially, I mean, part of the reason Zach and I initially um, became friends and colleagues who very much like support each other, I think, was because of the egregious civil liberties violations of COVID and a sense that the mainstream narrative that we were being given was really not accurate. And so I don't think it led either of us to these like deep conspiratorial rabbit holes per se, but it definitely was a little bit of this come to Jesus moment of like what the mainstream is telling us on this is really not matching with reality for sure and i mean that's the other component i think of the show title is that the just asking questions attack like oh he's just asking questions i think it it actually has been overdone a little bit at this point like with the pandemic and lockdown stuff that you were just talking about there were a lot of people who were legitimate skeptics of some of these policies who were just constantly being accused of just asking questions. You know, our last guest, just a single, he gets that on social media all the time. It's even though what's trying to discredit people when in reality, yeah. the questions that Jesse is asking are very appropriate questions, I think. Yeah. And a lot of his reporting has been pretty much validated by that extremely con comprehensive review out of England. So I think some pushback and reappropriation of the just asking questions phrase might be warranted in that moment. But I, other, I do get. Yeah, go ahead. The other thing that I think uh, Sweet Benjamin is maybe discounting is the fact that just asking questions is abbreviated to be J.A.Q. And to some degree, I think uh, I at least appreciate being able to refer to our jackassery in private. And so having a useful abbreviation is good because at least one of the things, yeah. you know, we take our guests seriously and the topics that we cover seriously. But honestly, the worst thing is journalists taking themselves too seriously. And so to some degree, there's a little bit of levity that we 
um, goof around with. Yeah. So thanks for listening, jackasses. Um, and I, I do, I do get your concerns, Benjamin. Uh, and like, Benjamin frankly, like only non jackass among them. Yeah. Uh, I like, I get where he's coming from, honestly. And I sometimes worry that the name could be a turnoff for booking some guests. Uh, but I like to thank our work for reason and the content of the show can speak for itself. And I guess time will tell on that, but I yeah. really appreciate yeah. the thoughtful question. Everything else is a turn on for guests. So we got it. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.